So now let's set up our text editor. Now you can use any text editor you like uh, for this course and in general in your life. Um, I'm going to be using Sublime Text 3 just because it's what I'm used to and I know that it can do everything that we need it to do. Um, but if you're using Atom or Visual Studio Code, those are all valid options. And a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you conceptually exists in some other form or even in exactly the same kind of plugin for those IDEs. So this is uh, Sublime Text 3 after it's been installed. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to open up our settings. So uh, here, like almost any Mac app, you can get to the settings by going to by pressing Command comma. Um, but I'll show you how to get to it from the menu. So you can see I go to Sublime Text, Preferences, and Settings, and open on another monitor. But you'll see something that looks kind of like this, where the defaults uh, that are built in are on the left, and this thing you can't edit. And then on the right is your stuff, your user settings. So the first thing that we're going to do is look for what's called folder exclude patterns. And the reason we're doing this is because there's certain folders and files which you really don't want to get confused about um, because they, they either are or contain files that look like something else that you might actually want to be editing or referencing, but they're definitely not that thing. Um, so for example, like if you're editing the CSS for a particular web page and you make some changes, you might realize that later that the thing that you were editing uh, was actually the compiled output. So uh, all of your changes will be lost. And you don't want that. So we'll copy this folder exclude patterns thing here on the left, and we'll paste it into our custom user settings. And the reason we have to do this is because, at least for Sublime, it isn't very smart about respecting uh, merging. So it's not going to merge these arrays together. And I think it's because it wants to allow you to override this stuff. Um, I'll rip, set it up like that for you so you can see it. And we're going to add to this list of stuff which is mainly version control files. We're going to add node modules. And we're going to add .temp. Now, node modules is where stuff gets installed when you use npm or yarn to pull down a package from uh, the package manager. And these uh, packages are really not things that you should be editing in line. And so you really don't want them coming up in your menus or when you're using the quick switcher to try to jump to a file. Because once again, you might edit the totally wrong thing. Um, the temp folder, now this is a sales uh, specific concept. And this is where your uh, output from compiling your assets goes. So sales asset pipeline takes your less files or if you're using maybe TypeScript or CoffeeScript, those files and jumbles them all up. In production, it minifies them. And whatever that output is, it sticks it into the .temp folder. Um, if you've used other kind of tools like Gulp or Grunt or Webpack or Brunch or whatever, you probably are used to seeing stuff like this. Um, and it's the same kind of issue you would face uh, with a project built on one of those things. So next, we'll uh, copy over the file exclude patterns. And this is just one uh, Slightly less important thing, but something that has bit uh, members of my team in the past, where you, uh, you're you opening what you think is your package.json file, and it's not actually your package.json file. It's this new thing called a package lock file that was introduced in NPM 5. And the lock file is great and useful for uh, all kinds of things uh, as far as speeding up NPM, but it's not so great when you make decisions based on uh, looking at the wrong file, right? So we're going to put package lock in here, package lock.json. And that's it for our settings. Um, there's a few more things that we can do that are uh, kind of nice to have, which I will, I'll run through really quick. But as far as like the, the baseline to protect yourself, uh, with this stuff, you'll be good. Next thing I'll show you are key bindings. Um, so in Sublime, we get to that through Sublime Text, Preferences, and Key Bindings. And it'll look something like this. And on the left, you can see all of the default hotkeys. And on the right, you can see an empty, clean slate for us to put stuff into. 
Now these, uh, the two things I'm going to show you are somewhat, uh, you know, personal preferences. And certainly if you were using a different language other than JavaScript, I wouldn't say that you should use them. But because this is JavaScript, uh, this first one in particular starts to be a lot more useful. So the first thing we're going to do is look for the word paste and indent. And we can see that as well as paste here. And we'll copy it over. And what this is doing by default is when you hit Command-V, just like in you know, any other app, it's going to paste what's in your computer's clipboard. But there's also this really cool thing, super uh, Command-Shift-V, which will actually paste and automatically fix the indentation. And since indentation of whatever you're pasting won't matter in JavaScript because JavaScript doesn't care about indentation, I find it usually a better idea to switch these and make it so that a normal paste is command shift V and paste with indent is just command V. One other uh, less important thing, but something that does make it a little bit easier to refactor your code is uh, this. So if we look for in unindent and indent, we'll find that there's these hotkeys to do like command right bracket, command left bracket. If we copy these over, we'll, uh, we can assign them to different keys. So by default in Sublime, you can hit Command, Control, up and down. It's a little bit different on Windows, same idea. And that lets you move lines around. And this is really handy, especially when you're like reorganizing the keys of a dictionary, a plain JavaScript object, or like items in an array. But uh, what is really nice is the idea that you can move in all directions. And by default, Control, Command, left and right don't do indentation. So what we're going to do is change this to uh, give us that flexibility. So control plus command plus left becomes, uh, oops, I got it backwards. Control command right becomes indent and control command left becomes unindent. And now what that allows us to do is move all around in a circle without having to think about it at all. Um, and this comes in handy later on, especially when we're dealing with stuff that might be kind of uh, deeply nested inside of other objects. So next thing we need to do in our editor is install package control. This is a Sublime specific thing uh, in Microsoft Visual Studio Code. It's already built into the editor. Um, and in other editors you might be using, it could be one way or the other. In Sublime, it works like this. So you have to open this command palette thing, if it's even called that. Basically, you hit shift command P, whatever it's called, and this little guy pops up. And it's probably a little bit hard to read, but it's OK because you don't ever have to actually read it for the most part. You're just going to want to type uh, package control or install package control. And you'll see that because I don't already have package control installed, all I see is this one option. So I'll pick it. And without any indication of what's going on until bam, it was successfully installed, and it works. So I'll do exactly the same thing again now that I have that. And I'm going to install some Sublime plugins. So again, Command-Shift-P to open up this little guy here. And we'll type install package and pick the first option. So there's going to be a bit of delay while it thinks about it and loads this list, uh, don't worry. And uh, now we're seeing all the packages that are available in Sublime's package registry. So the first thing we're going to bring in is something called editor config. And this is just a good idea if you're ever working with anyone else or if your code might ever be used by anyone else. And it helps kind of make sure that the indentation gets automatically fixed whenever you save. Um, it won't do anything bad for us because we're not using a language where indentation has semantic value. Next thing we'll do is we'll install EJS2. Oops. And we choose EJS2 because this is the one that's uh, updated and maintained. And it is just syntax highlighting for EJS, which is the template language in sales. It's kind of like ERB or uh, any of your other kind of like Java server pages or PHP syntax you might be familiar with. Next up, we'll install less. And this is, again, syntax highlighting. This is for the less style sheet syntax. Uh, it's what we'll be using in this course. You can also use Stylus or Sass or uh, any of the newer options that are out there. 
Um, next up, we'll install Sublime Linter, which is kind of the base thing that we're going to use to check our syntax. And this is probably the most important uh, package that we'll actually install, other than the plugin that we're about to follow this up with. So last but not least, we'll get what's called the ESLint plugin. And in our case, it's called Sublime Linter Contrib ESLint. And this is just an interface to ESLint. So you have to have ESLint installed globally in order to do this. And we're going to come back to that and, uh, in a subsequent video and actually install it once we've gone over NPM. Um, but what this does is gives us not only syntax highlighting for JavaScript, but error checking. And it allows us to use a single file to kind of dictate what's going to be valid code and what's not before you ever actually have to test it in the browser or in the terminal. So that's it for this section. We've gone over some of the basics of setting up a text editor in a way that's going to future-proof your future development efforts. Now in the next video, we're going to go a little bit deeper into the terminal, and we're going to look at some things you can do to uh, make sure that you understand the things you're likely to encounter using Node and Sales in the terminal, and also set yourself up to be able to take advantage of some shortcuts.